Hello, everyone. Let me just double check I'm in the right place. Okay. Hello. Welcome back. Here is Two Roads Chapter 7. Before we start, we are going to do a recap. What happened? So, Chapter 6 recap. Cal and Pop make their way to a hobo camp in the forest where Pop is reunited with some of his fellow soldiers. Next, we learn that hobos use hidden symbols on signposts to indicate which towns are friendly towards Knights of the Rose and which are dangerous. Okay. Let's start chapter seven called A Fine Mulligan. Chapter seven, A Fine Mulligan. It's later in the day. From the position of the sun in the sky, and by what Pop calls my internal timekeeper, I reckon it to be about 6 in the p.m. Time for dinner. Cap has dragged out a pot. He starts sloshing the water I just lugged in an old galvanized pail from the nearby creek he pointed out to me. When it's half full, he hangs its handle on an iron tripod over the fire in front of his shanty. This fire, burning brightly, has been made using wood so dry that no telltale smoke is rising up from it. The wood stacked around it has been just as carefully chosen. No wet logs, whose moisture would turn into thick clouds of water vapor, like the Indian smoke signals I saw in a Western movie. Cap sits back on his packing crate. That fire, the pot, the water in it, and a handful of salt is all that he plans to contribute. Pop reaches into his pocket and pulls out three potatoes. All right, Cap says. Earth apples is a great start. Fine, firm spuds, like the ones he produced earlier in the boxcar to add to the professor's little frying pan. The rest of those given him by Ms. Euler. They're good-sized and solid and red-skinned. Pop doesn't peel them, just cuts them into chunks with his knife and plops them into the pot. Sorry, one sec. I want to make sure you can hear me. Okay, good. Continue. Another bow comes up to join us, holding something green in his hands. He leans toward the pot, but Cap puts up a hand to stop him. Show us what you got first, shorty, Cap says. Which is a good idea. I have, in the past few months, seen one mulligan stew nearly spoiled when a half-lit rum-dum bow tried to pour in a double handful of smelly dirt. Greens, shorty says, opening his palms. Green wild onions just pulled. Washed them good, Cap. Real good. Cap gestures toward the pot, and Shorty dumps in his contribution. One by one, others add to the stew. Esam Dart is among them. He hands Pop a number two can with 20 ounces of kidney beans. The next man contributes a good-sized turnip that Pop cuts into thin slices. A number three can of sliced tomatoes, then six carrots. The mulligan is already smelling heavenly to me. Though I suspect, with the appetite I've worked up from not eating all day, that boiled shoe leather might also seem appetizing. But it's not yet finished. Cap reaches down under his crate and pulls out a bag of flour. Thickener, he says, stirring in a couple of sizable scoops with a big spoon he also produces from under his wooden seat. Would a bit of meat be welcome, good sirs? A familiar voice asks from behind me. Courtesy of my sibling's eldest offspring. I turn to look at the professor. He is holding up a ham hock, displaying it as if it was some sort of prize, which of course it is. Every one of the seven of us gathered round Cap's fire expressed their assent. You bet. Yes, sirree, Bob. Uh, yep. For sure. Indeed he do. Thank you, professor. Those last words being, of course, from Pop, to which I add a hearty nod. The ham hock boiled into the mix. The stew seems all set. But Cap adds a few more surprises in the form of spices. Like a magician pulling a rabbit from a top hat, he makes pepper and dill appear and artfully stirs them in. My mouth is watering, but I remember my manners, as does everyone else. No one tries to dig in. Finally, after half an hour has passed, Cal raises his wooden spoon like a baton. Time to test her. Cap rasps. 
he dips the big spoon into the stew and then, to my surprise, holds the full spoon out to me. I blow on the spoon and take a taste. It's so good I feel as if I am about to faint. Somehow, I manage to hand the empty wooden spoon back to our gray-bearded cook without gnawing on the wood. Well, young feller, he says, would be your verdict. I hold out both hands and do a double thumbs up. All righty, Cap says. Time to chow down. Everyone starts to lean in except for Pop and me, whose lead I always follow. Hold your horses, Cap says. He pulls out a series of mismatched cups, some chipped and cracked but serviceable. Wash them in the stream once you're done, he states. One after another, Cap fills the cups and passes them out. Each of us refills our cups more than once until the last of the mulligan is gone. We'll clean the pot for you, Cap. Pop volunteers. Thank you, Will, the old man says, beaming a gap-toothed grin through his whiskers. You are a blowed in the glass, bow, for sure. I have to smile at that compliment. It's the highest one night of the road can give another. To be called blowed in the glass means being recognized as true blue, someone you trust with your life. We'll take all those cups, too, Pop says. Right, Cal? I nod and collect the cups. They're already near as clean as anyone might get them from using not just spoons, but index fingers to scoop out every last drop of the mulligan. We shoulder our bindles as we stand up. It's not likely anyone would steal them while we are gone, but a bow who takes it for granted that everyone else is as honest as he is, is a bow who believes in mountains made of rock candy. Despite the dark, which never bothers Pop or renders him near blind like most men confronted by a lack of light, we make our way sure-footed back to that little brook, which I hear babbling 50 yards before we reach its edge. We have emerged from the shade of the trees, and with the light from the moon, it's brighter here by the water. Near as easy to see as if it were day. The creek is no more than a few feet deep and 10 feet wide. There's a flat rock by a small waterfall where I filled the bucket during my first trip to the stream. I kneel on it and rinse out each cup after Pop has scoured it with wet white sand from the creek bed. Last of all, I lever the heavy pot, almost too big to lift, into the swift flow. I hold the handle with my left hand and run my right hand around the inside of the pot. Then, dumping out the water, I give up the handle to Pop, who lifts the weighty pot effortlessly from the brook. He piles the seven cups carefully into the pot. Then, instead of starting back to the jungle... He sits and leans back on his bindle. I'm glad of that. This is a peaceful place. The music of the little stream is nearly as soothing to my ears as the rhythm of a boxcar's wheels on rails of steel. I could close my eyes and fall asleep here, secure that I'd be safe with Pop by my side. I'm also glad because Pop sitting down means he is ready to talk. Maybe he's finally going to answer those questions that have been buzzing through my brain like bees most of the day. Pop stretches his bad leg straight out in front of him. He rubs his knee with both hands. I'm sorry to see that. It means it has been paining him. He never complains, but I've seen how his lips get tight when he does that. So, he says, straightening back up. Where was I? I do not venture an opinion. That was not a real question. Just what Pop says when about to start speaking on one topic or another. Where do I begin? Another question that isn't. So I wait. Well, Pop says, you know a good bit of it already. What happened, that is, which leads us to where we sit at this moment in time. It's just you didn't know what my story was. Which, so to speak, is also your own. When my father begins talking in this roundabout way, it might be frustrating to some. Luckily for me, I'm used to it. It's the way he might begin if he were to tell me more about over there in the Great War. I take his verbal maneuvering as a good sign and settle back farther. I am talking, Pop finally says, about my family, our family, your great-great-grandparents. They were full-blood Creek, as were my own parents. One of the five civilized tribes, forced to leave our homelands in Georgia, leave behind a good-sized farm where they had hundreds of acres of crops, herds of cattle, and a fine living. 
leave for no other reason than they were Indian, and white men wanted their land. Sent to Indian territory, which is where I grew up as Will Blackbird. Blackbird, not Black. That is my real last name, and yours too. Blackbird, I'm thinking. I actually like that name better than just plain Black. Somehow it seems more right for Pop and me. But something else is happening. As Pop talks, I'm finding myself somewhere else. I'm seeing people dressed in old-fashioned clothing. Men and women and children. People with faces as brown as Pop's. Those people are calling out to one another in a strange language I almost understand. Men in uniforms and carrying long guns are pushing us out of our log cabins. Fires are burning. We're being driven from our homes. I shake my head and I'm back sitting by my father's side. The light from the half moon is throwing a shadow across his face. Around us, the forest is a dark haze. The sounds of the stream and the calling of night birds from the trees make this all seem as much like a dream as the vision I just had. Am I really here? Am I awake or asleep? Is my father, who I thought I knew better than any other person in the whole world, actually telling me this? He actually is an Indian? Why have I never heard this till now? Instead of answering my questions, he's just adding on more. I have to ask something now. One question in particular. A question that's beating its wings like a bat stuck inside my head. Why? I say. Why didn't you tell me? Pop turns toward me. Because the moon is in the sky behind him, it casts his whole face into darkness. I can't see his eyes or his lips moving as he speaks. We did it, Pop says. Your mother and I, to protect you. If any of the confusion in my head can be seen on my face, I must look as uncertain as a deer caught in the headlights of a car. Pop reaches out to grasp my shoulder. I know, Cal, he says. It's a lot to have to take in. I nod. Thing is, Pop says, it's not easy being Indian. People look at you different, treat you different. This may be the land of the free and the home of the brave. But when you are seen as a brave, you are a lot less free. I know Pop means that as a joke, but it's not really funny. I just nod again. There's too many out there who think Indians are stupid and backward. Worthless drunks, dirty and uncivilized, he says, his voice soft. It's not much different from how they see a man who's black. I wanted to get you away from that. No matter what you do, as an Indian, you're never as good as a white man. In their minds, it is only white men who are created equal. Not long ago, if you were an Indian, you couldn't vote. But you could fight for this country. Indians weren't even American citizens until 1924. But if people think you are white, it's different. White men have all the rights. If our family could pass, if you could pass for white, there might be no end of opportunities. I've seen how black men are treated. Seen it more times than I'd like. I believe and have always tried to live by what Pop has told me ever since I could understand words. We all are the same under the skin. One man's blood is just the same color as the next man's. And you can never judge any person or anything by how they look on the outside. Some of nature's deadliest creatures are really pretty to look at. Like the black widow spider whose bite is poison. That's why, when I joined the army, I kept quiet about being Indian. I would have been treated different. That's for sure. I just told people who asked why I was so tan that it was my Italian blood. Pop chuckles. Not that I had any. Did mom know? Pop smiles. I was never able to hide anything from your mother. The second thing she asked, right after asking me to marry her, was about that. Except it was more a statement than a question. Sort of like her proposal. You are an Indian, she said to me. Just like that. Pop shakes his head, looking off to his left as he does when he remembers things. Your mom had a gift, Cal. Seems like you have it too. She had this way of knowing things no one else could know. Sometimes even seeing things before they happened. So I had to fess up to her about how I was passing for white. Pop stays quiet for a long time. What did mom say then? 
I finally ask. She said she understood. How it was a little like being foreign or an orphan and having people look down on you. She also said that it was probably better for people not to know. If we were going to get a mortgage on the farm we were going to buy, the bank would be more likely to give it to a white couple who are a tanned war veteran and a nurse, and not an Indian and a dirty immigrant. We always planned to tell you someday, but we were so happy together, and we thought it would make things easier for you. Even though your mom could see things, she never saw the worst of what was going to happen to us. Pop goes silent again. The way the moon is shining on his face, I can see that his eyes are moist. I'm having a hard time not crying myself. I understand now why Pop reacted that way when Boney called him Injun Joe. I can see how it must have hurt him to be lumped in with that picture of an Indian as a murderous, drunken savage. Okay, I think. So Pop is Indian. Or rather, he was Indian till he joined the army. And then he and my mom decided he should keep passing as white to get our farm. Maybe I can accept that. Though it's a lot to wrap my head around. But what does his being Indian, even former Indian, make me? Indian too? Half Indian? I look at Pop, about to ask another question. But he beats me to it. Why now? Pop says. Is that what you are wondering, Cal? Why tell you now about your blood? And why talk about Indian school, I think? Pop nods. I suspect that nod is as much to himself as it is to me. Somewhere back in the forest, an owl... Hoo-loo-loo-sh. Pop cocks his head in that direction. Pretty soon, another owl answers farther off to our left. I've always liked hearing the call of an owl, though it can startle you some. That's what it's meant to do if you are something small an owl likes to eat. Make a mouse jump, rustle the leaves enough so that the owl can swoop in on silent wings and grab it. My grandpa, Pop says, told us that an owl calling like that might be a bad omen. A warning that something bad was about to happen. At Chilagi, they taught us that an owl was just an owl. Pop shakes his head. Chilagi, he says again. Ha! <laughs> You should have heard the stories the older boys told us about owls and witches when none of the teachers or disciplinarians were around. Especially the Cherokee boys. Those scary stories made you pull the covers over your head once you were in bed. Mason Bushyhead. He was Eastern Cherokee and 15 years old. He told us little boys about something that happened in House 4, the dorm where the younger boys lived back then. It happened back when he was my age, which was 8 at the time. He said something woke him up in the middle of the night. It was the sound of someone eating. He peeked out from under his covers and what he saw chilled him to the bone. There was a green light hovering over Charlie Cornsilk, four beds down from him. And he could see a shape floating in the middle of that light. A person it was. And that person was holding something bloody in its hands and chewing on it. Then that witch, for that was what it had to be, reached a bony hand down, shoved it into little Charlie's side, and pulled out another piece of his liver. Mason said he screamed then. He couldn't help himself. And as soon as he let out that scream, that witch turned into an owl, shot up right through the ceiling, and was gone. His scream woke everybody up. They lit the lanterns, but there was nothing to see. Except that Charlie Cornsilk was real pale and sick, and so they took him to the infirmary where he died two days later. Pop goes silent as soon as he finishes that tale. He's told me other stories in the past, but never one like this. Most often they have been tales about animals acting like people and doing foolish things. Not Indian boarding schools or witches. It was like hearing someone else other than my father talking. Even his voice, as he told that story, was different. It scared me because I found myself in that dormitory as my father was talking. I was taken over as he told it, seeing things he was not mentioning. Like the way one boy's boots at the bottom of his bed had fallen over. Or that the boy three beds away from Charlie Cornsilk was crying in darkness. Or that the lantern they lit had a cracked glass. Or that the letters C, C had been carved into the side of the low rafter over Charlie Cornsilk's bed. Pop shakes his head. I don't know why I told you that story, Cal. I didn't even know I remembered it. 
Funny how things come back to you when you start talking about the past. I ran my train way off on a sidetrack, didn't I? Pop laughs. A little one that sounds almost like he's clearing his throat. Why well, talk about being Indian now when I hit it ever since I married your mother and we decided it was the way to make a better life for our family? Pop's voice is dead serious. Son, it is because of where we are now. Just look at us. Now I do not mean there is any shame about this hobo life, especially when a man follows the ethical code. But I am the one who chose this way, not you. Cal, this was not your choice. I'm still upset about what I saw as Pop told that story. Why is it that I keep finding myself in other people's memories? And why is it that they always seem to be dead people? I can't talk to Pop about that. It would worry him. But that's not the most important thing right now. What's important are Pop's plans for me. Maybe I can still change his mind. Pop, I say. I'm happy being a beau. I think my life is fine now. My father shakes his head, turning it just enough so that the moonlight shines on his face. I make out that there are tears in his eyes. Son, a man needs the chance to make choices. I thought my making the choice for you of being white would be the best. But that was before this whole country went to hell in a handbasket. There are no opportunities now unless you were born a rich man. Doesn't matter now whether you are white or red. When you are without a job and you have no food and no idea about where to go, you are not better or worse than an Indian. And that is how they treat you when you are down and out. Including those of us who fought in Flanders fields to make this world a better place. Now I do have an idea about some place to go. Two ideas, that is. One idea for each of us. Pop slaps his chest and I hear not just the thump of his hand against his ribcage, but a flatter sound. Paper, maybe? Sure enough, when Pop reaches into his coat, he pulls out that newspaper he was reading. This is my idea, he says. I've been thinking about it. It's an idea for both of us. Let me tell you about it, and then you can tell me if you'll agree. That's important. Because if you do not agree, then there is no way I am going to force you. I nod to that. Okay, I say. That's the code. Pop nods back. Rule number one. Decide your own life. Don't let another person run or rule you. Remember Joe Angelo? Pop asks. What he did? That confuses me some. No, I admit. Pop smiles. Sorry, Cal. I'm jumping the gun a bit. Too many things going through my head right now. You know who I am talking about, though. Yes. He's the vet who walked to Washington. That I do understand. Okay. What Joe did was to put himself on the line. He spoke up for all of us who served. Spoke up about our bonuses. But he wasn't the first to do that. Last year, back in December, a bunch of men went to Washington and staged a hunger strike. Then this priest from Pittsburgh led a whole army of jobless men to agitate for help for the unemployed. And now... Pop raises his hand and makes a circle. There's talk of more of us going there from a man named Walt Walters, a veteran himself. His idea is that we can be an army of peaceful warriors, asking that the Congress and old President Hoover treat us fair and square and give us our bonus money. Pop's eyes glisten in the moonlight, as if lit by a fire from within. Think of that, Cal. Thousands of men camping out in the very heart of the nation. Asking the nation to open its heart to those of us who fought for freedom. And if we do get our bonuses, Pop puts his hand on his pack, where his own compensation certificate is carefully stowed away. Then I'll have enough money for us to get a little place of our own and a good life. A federal mortgage, vocational training. All that could happen. I could get us a house. Really settle us in again. Part of me likes the thought of that. The bonus money coming through. A whole thousand dollars. Us back on a farm of our own. But part of me is wondering if that is really possible. Young as I am, I know that President Hoover has a heart of stone as far as poor folks and veterans go. All he cares about is the rich. 
No matter how many men go to Washington, he is not going to change his stripes any more than a hyena is going to change into a horse. I can't say that to Pop, though. I have to repeat what I said before. I like being on the road, Pop. It's aces being a beau. I like being with you. We already have a good life. Pop looks at me with a bit of surprise. That was a long statement for me to make. He reaches out and pats my foot. Cal, he says. Cal, Cal. Then he sighs. You are going to be a good man, son. But our life is not good right now. We are getting by, but that is about all. This is not the way I'd choose for you if it was up to me. Now I did decide to lead this sort of life after I ran away from Indian school the last time. Riding the rails was freedom to me. About the only freedom I could imagine for an Indian kid with no family. And then it was the army. But when your mother and I met, when we were able to have a place of our own, when we had you, son, that was a good life. And I want us to have it again. Pa picks up a stick and starts scratching it on the earth that would look as red as blood in the daytime, but as dark in the moon's half light. But there's light enough for me to see what he is drawing. It is half of a circle. This is what I think, he says, tracing part way around the circle. This is the way I have to go now, to Washington. Then he moves the stick back to the starting point and tracing part way around in the opposite direction. And this is the way you have to go while I'm gone. He lifts the stick and looks up at me. Just while I'm gone, he says. Because you can't go to Washington with me. I'm not saying it'll be dangerous, but it'll be an army. And you are not ready yet to be part of any army. And you cannot be riding the rails on your own. Boy, your age alone? No, sir. I want to know you'll be safe with three hots and a cot. He looks at the stick in his hand. I never wanted being seen as Indian for you, Cal. I thought you knowing about your heritage would do you no good. And I sure as blazes never thought back when we had our farm that an Indian school would be in your future. It's taken me a lot of time and a lot of thinking to come to this, son. But the way things are, in this country and in our lives, I just can't see another way. If there was any other road, I'd take it. But I cannot think of any place other than Old Plains View that would give you not just an education, but also food every day and a roof over your head. Pop pauses. Then again, he says, you will be also joining a sort of army there. They'll get you a uniform and learn military discipline. He chuckles. One thing they teach you for sure at Indian school is how to answer the bugle and march in formation, just like soldiers. Having a uniform and being like Pop was in the army sort of interests me. But it is still far from anything I'd choose if it was up to me. Pop turns back to the shape he scratched in the dirt. Anyhow, Cal, it won't be for that long, he says. Just till I am done in D.C. and I can come back and get you. Coming back to get me. That's the first totally good thing I've heard in everything Pop has been telling me. But... For the first time in my life, a part of me is wondering if I can trust him. I've never, ever mistrusted my father before. Now, though, I just don't know. Pop looks at me. I have no doubt he is seeing the uncertainty on my face as obvious as a question mark painted in the middle of my forehead. Now look, he begins moving the stick on one side and then the other of his rough drawing, completing the circle. See how the two halves come back together again? That's us, son. We'll just be apart for a while. I opened my mouth to say something. I'm not sure what. But whatever I was going to say is forgotten as soon as we hear the gunshots. Uh-oh. So that is the end of Chapter 7, everyone. Make sure you answer the questions and write the gist.